And now I'd like to invite to stage our panelists this morning. Dr. Hawa Abdi Dablawi, the founder of the Dr. Hawi Abdi Foundation and her daughter, Diko Mohammed. <laughs> Diko came out first, so I'm sorry I got the order incorrect. Um, Stephen Felice, the President and Chief Commercial Officer for Dell Inc. Dr. Mohammed Yunus, the chairman of the Yunus Center. That, that was a real like rock star welcome. Um, and Shabana Bashi Rasik, the managing director of the School of Leadership Afghanistan, otherwise known as SOLA. I think the panelists should always get more applause than the moderator, so I think that's pretty great. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Yunus because I've known him the longest um, and because I think it really is a segue from the commitment announcement that we just had. You know, as, as I think many of you know, given the volume of applause that greeted him, um, but some of you may not, uh, the Grameen Bank, which Dr. Yunus started before I was born, uh, has now lent more than $11 billion to more than 8 million um, borrowers, and 97% of those borrowers are women. And I think that for a panel that is about um, kind of investing in the future, we almost have to start with Dr. Yunus, because a loan really is a contract about the future. I give you money because you say you're going to do X tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. Um, and it may seem self-evident that investing in women was a smart thing to do, but you actually started off mainly with male lenders and then quickly pivoted. Could you talk about kind of what uh, precipitated that pivot and kind of what you've learned over now your years of, of partnering with all of your women borrowers? Well, thank you. I thought you know all about it, so <laughs> you could explain much better. Uh, you have visited uh, 18 years now in uh, Bangladesh, uh, the Grameen Bank. It's a very strange thing. Uh, I was trying to uh, s uh, overcome the problem of loan sharking in the village next door where I was teaching at the university, and I see the terrible problem of loan sharking. So I thought this is a terrible problem, but I can solve it not for the whole world, but I can solve it for this village. Why don't I lend the money myself rather than load sharks to it? If I do it, then the problem is done for this village. And I did that. And from there, the whole idea of step-by-step uh, -step expanding that came. And when I formally started lending money, the basic issue that I resolved to myself that this would be something where people should not go to the bank Banks should go to people. This was number one promise that I made. A debate we're having in this country I still know, right now, it's too. A, it's everywhere. The second one that I've been criticizing the banking system in Bangladesh, saying, look, not only you refuse loan to the poor people, you refuse loan to all women. Even if you're the rich woman, you don't lend it to her. So I argued that uh, this is something built into the system, not just casually done. I challenged them saying not even 1% of the borrowers of all the banks in Bangladesh happen to be women. So I said something terribly wrong in that system. So when I began, I wanted to make sure half the borrowers in my program are women. But when I start doing that, only men come forward, women don't. I tried to take my students, girl students, to go and explain to them because I couldn't go to them, them uh, being a man, I'm not allowed to meet them. So I take my girl student to talk to them. And they all say, no, 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 I don't know anything about money, don't give the money to me, give it to my husband. I said, no, we're not going to give the husband, we're giving it to you. And then my students, girls, they said, look, they are not going to take money because they don't know anything. Why are you insisting on that? I said, look, when a woman says, I don't know how to use the money, I'm afraid of money, always remember this is not her voice, it's the voice of the history which is created around her the rejection, the fear, 
the threat. So she's the product of that history. Our job is to go back again and again to peel off that fear until she becomes a normal human being, overcoming the history behind her. And one day, one of these women will say, maybe I should try. If she tried, if she's successful, this will have a snowball effect. It took us six years to come to that point. And finally, that started rolling. And then we came to the 50-50. Then we saw money going to the women, bringing so much more benefit to the family than money going to men. So we changed our policy, focused on women. That's the reason why 97% of our borrowers are women. When the I mean, idea spread all over the world, they didn't wait for this 3% men anymore. They went straight to women, it's 100% women now, all over the world, including what we do in New York City. We run program in New York City, we have more than 12,000 borrowers right there in New York City. All of them, 100% of them are women. So, clearly, uh, patience and persistence are important, not just virtues, but um, determinants of success. And Shavana, you really exemplify that, I think. I mean, given the welcome you received, it sounds as if your story is also known, but for a brief kind of reprisal, you spent years dressed as a boy, walking to and from school, 45 minutes each way, so that you could go to a secret school for girls and ensure that you were getting the education that you knew you deserved. And then while you were a student at Middlebury, do we have any Middlebury students here? Um, you, you still felt a responsibility, remarkably, um, not only to complete your own education, but to expand opportunities for girls in Afghanistan. Can you talk a little bit about kind of when you knew that kind of this challenge that you were solving for yourself was one that you felt a responsibility to solve kind of for the future of your country and also how you navigated being a student at Middlebury and also kind of building your work in Afghanistan? Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, when I came to Middlebury, I realized um, being in a place, it's, you know, among a lot of privileged kids and uh, realizing that I was also uh, an extremely privileged uh, young Afghan woman, um, kind of waking up to the reality that I'm one of the 6% of women in Afghanistan who have made it beyond high school. Um, so while I felt quite privileged, again, that I'm part of this very small minority of women, educated women in Afghanistan, uh, with it came this uh, sense of moral obligation and responsibility that I have to do something because I have made it to this point what is it that I can do to help other women? And also, uh, that was encouraged uh, with a lot of young girls from Afghanistan who would uh, contact me about um, how did you get to the US and I want to also study, I, I would really like you to help me. Um, and then uh, realizing that I grew up in, in Kabul city and relatively speaking, uh, the opportunities that girls have in, in, in uh, Kabul city or other major cities in Afghanistan, uh, are quite different from the opportunities that uh, girls have in rural Afghanistan where they face a lot more uh, barriers, uh, traditional security, uh, all sorts. Um, I mean, w under the Taliban, I uh, struggled to receive an education because the government banned uh, education for young girls. And then uh, realizing that after Taliban, there are still so many young women across the country who continue to struggle. It's no longer the government that bans education for them, but it's the lack of opportunities, lack of resources, uh, families not seeing the value in um, educating daughters, their education's coming second to their brothers. So a number of uh, all of these uh, really led me to start this uh, initiative. And I co-founded this with an American who's 77, and his own words, he uh, flunked out retirement in uh, 2000. Uh, three, to find his second home in Afghanistan, <laughs> a very remarkable person. Um, both with the belief that um, if we want uh, Afghanistan to prosper, to have a uh, future, uh, we need uh, an educated force in Afghanistan, and especially educated women because of that multiplying effect in investing in girls' education. The, uh, it, it, you know, the women, educated women tend to give more to the community. Um, and also realizing that uh, opportunities for women are a lot less than uh, boys have in Afghanistan. 
Um, and again, you know, I was uh, a college student myself. Um, it really takes that persistence, patience, and also the belief that you can do something. When I started, uh, a lot of times when I would reach out to people to support it, startups are not very easy. Um, oftentimes, uh, Ted and I, would, um, the co-founder of Sola, we would go to different places to talk about Sola, and um, we both had a similar problem, uh, age. He was too old and I was too young. Uh, so we started talking about how uh, the average age we have is really important, and we can <laughs> Uh, we bring together 100 years of experience to Sola, uh, adding our age. Um, and, you know, I ha we had to, you know, when you start something, you really have to believe that if, if you are the one who believe in, uh, in your mission, in, in, in the cause that you're trying to promote, um, don't let people's uh, comments uh, discourage you or stop you. I, I often would get... Or, or, so you're trying to build the first international boarding school in Afghanistan? Yes, and you are 23? Yes, wow, that's very ambitious, good luck. You know, indirectly saying, you know, something negative, and, and uh, we had to get past that to, to make a point. And today, uh, we started in 2008 with four students uh, who joined SOLA. Today, we have 25 students in Kabul from 16 different provinces, uh, a lot of them from rural parts of Afghanistan. We have helped more than uh, 29 students uh, receive scholarships abroad, um, outside of Afghanistan, in the US, UK, uh, the King's Academy uh, in Jordan, and the Asian University for Women in Bangladesh. And combined, it's 91 years of education worth more than $4 million. So, there is something that, you know, it's not huge, but it's, it makes a difference. You know that all of those students will pay it forward. They will invest in other uh, people's education, and, and they will go back to make a difference. Thank and, you. And sometimes um, when you begin, you have no idea where you're going to go. And I think Dr. Abdi's story really exemplifies that in some ways. Um, in 1983, Dr. Abdi, when you started a one-room clinic on your family farm, um, I imagine you didn't think, you know, 30 years later that you would be, you know, effectively housing 90,000 people, have built a 400-bed medical center, um, and providing schooling for hundreds of children. And yet that's exactly what you've done. And Diko, thank you so much for being here to translate for your mother. Um, I think Dr. Abdi would be really uh, enlightening for all of us to understand when you first knew that you had to build a school, which like alone is invariably about the future, and kind of how you have worked with the children and the parents, but particularly the mothers, to ensure that the children believe they can have a very different future than the past that led their families to take refuge on your farm. Thank you, thank you. Uh, in my time, Somali was a remote area. The society did not understand what the value of the education, but my father was an educated man, and we were, and we were three, four sisters. He was not having a boy. We had one boy, and he immediately died after born. But my father was confident that his daughters can do whatever make a man. So my father decided to, to send me to school. All his friends said, wow, how you can send your daughter to the school? They will be spoiled. But he did not listen. He decided to send us a school. In our society, one. What? Ah, uh, you asking me the school of. Uh, yeah, but your answer is really interesting too. So please, like, <laughs> I think uh, Dr. Abdi, you can sorry, talk about I'm sorry. You want. <laughs> I, I, I'm not okay. I, I'm not well known, understood English language. So. You're doing a much better job than any of us could be doing oh, in Somali. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, you ask me the, the CAM school. I did not become first a uh, CAM school. I became a one room of clinic. Because women, Somali women, was dying maternal mortality of, of Somalia is very high, was very high. And rural area, they did not have uh, transportation at night. So I become, I wanted to go near the villages where they come walking. It was 98, 93, 83 when I began the, the, the one room of clinic. Then I moved from Mogadishu because at midnight maybe a patient will come. I built two rooms apartment near the, near the one room of clinic. Immediately, Mogadishu, the, the security became not good, so very many people of my friend, they come to my place. I hosted them. I began to, to assist in labor women. At night when the, someone be wounded to stop bleeding for emergency room, then bit by bit, it became large till now. Yeah, now it is 400 beds capacity, big hospital with 400 beds capacity. Um, if I just comment on uh, one point that Dr. Hawa brought up, uh, which is the role of uh, fathers. Um, you know, today, um, education, lack of access to education is a global problem. and. As we speak right now, there are more than 66 million girls uh, in the world who are waiting to be sent to school. Um, and it is throughout the world. Um, it could be anywhere, US, Afghanistan, anywhere in between. And there, you know, there has to, we really need to focus on bringing men to this conversation. Uh, <laughs> You're great, yes. the guy in the fourth row. Like, you, every time we say we need a man to do something, you raise your fist, you shout, like, <laughs> it's great. Thank you, yes, you know, thank there, you. Uh, one of my biggest supporters uh, in my life is my father. Um, he recognized the value in educating his daughters um, and his sons. Um, and uh, to this day, it's my father who constantly pushes me to uh, dream bigger, to think bigger for Sola, for... And, and I see this uh, as a theme uh, in our students' life. They come from some of the most conservative parts of the country. And, and there are, their, their fathers and their mothers are their, most, uh, their biggest supporters. Um, you know, we, I have one particular student who comes from Helmand province, and very recently she went home uh, uh, for a break, and as her father picked her up uh, at the airport, uh, on their way home, they narrowly missed a bomb blast. That was really um, sad for them. And he received a call as he reached home from um, the people who uh, are trying to um, kill her, or kill him basically, um, saying, we were planning your funeral. How, how come you're still alive? Um, if you send your daughter back to school in, in Kabul, um, we will kill you. And, and feel, people uh, felt threatened by the fact that this girl uh, came to Kabul for education and she's come back a few times more mature, um, sounds you know, very eloquent and, and, and uh, is uh, becoming a, model, a role model for the rest of the girls in the community. So that's, and, and then it takes this one particular family to say, go ahead, kill me if you want, kill me now. I'm not going to stop my daughter's education because of your threats. And, and the girl is back in Sola. So for, for education to become more available to girls in some of the most rural parts of the different uh, countries, we really have to involve men and, and especially fathers. So. Yeah, and I think, Stephen, it's often easy for those of us in the United States to think that these questions are only relevant outside the US. You know, that here, we have an egalitarian society, there are equal opportunities for boys and girls, it's a real meritocracy, and yet we know that the evidence doesn't actually support that. I mean, even though in fourth grade, girls and boys are equally 
adept at math and science tests, equally assert that they're interested in careers in math or science or engineering. Um, by the time high school comes around, you know, those numbers for girls have dropped precipitously, both in relative achievement and in relative ambition. And I don't think that that's you know, natural selection, and neither do any of the researchers who look at this. And it's an area actually where women have lost ground. I mean, in the mid-1980s, women comprised 35% or higher of the computer science graduates. In 2006, it was 20%, and last year it was 12%. So we are losing ground in what arguably is also a discipline that is profoundly about the future. So how do you think we reverse kind of this dynamic? How do we ensure that more girls are kind of kept engaged and inspired in what are colloquially known as the STEM program, science, technology, engineering, and math, through elementary school, middle school, high school, and then into college and, and beyond. Because certainly in the United States, if we want to be part of writing the future, we can't leave a whole gender behind. No, I, I... <laughs> you, you don't miss a beat either. <laughs> well, I, I think this really comes down to a question of, about empowerment, and then, which is really a, a major topic here. And uh, it's not just strictly teaching the technologies, math, science. It's also creating a support environment to enable uh, anyone, and in particular women, to feel like they can come forward, uh, that they can express their own opinions, that they can take risk. And uh, you know, many, many studies show that, that women um, have a tendency to not ask for that next thing. Uh, take the back seat, you know, and so a lot of the uh, a lot of the work that that we spend time on is just as much around mentoring as it is around enabling the technology itself. Uh, we started something called Dell Women's Entrepreneurial Network, uh, and it 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 did start in Asia. I was living in Asia, and uh, it was during the financial crisis. And we were looking for ways to get small businesses growing. And we were noticing that uh, throughout Asia, uh, the, the industrial nature of women was amazing. But the number of women that actually owned businesses and started their own businesses was, was really low. And when we examined it, more to your point, we found that it wasn't a, a lack of capability. It was really this lack of empowerment. And so we thought we would bridge the developed world and the developing world by getting these women together and helping them learn how to ask for more, how to network, how to start up businesses. Uh, and we started in China, and I think our, uh, our results were just okay. It was the first year, and we were learning, and we, also, we started to question whether this is the right thing to do. But, but the following year, we went to Brazil, and uh, it, it was an amazing year of showing us that we were doing the right things. For example, there was a woman, uh, Leila Velez, who grew up in a favela, a slum, some of the worst slums in the world. And she had a very simple problem. She didn't like how curly her hair was. Well, she developed an organic formula to straighten her hair. But she also knew that many, many women in Brazil didn't like how curly their hair was, and she had this thought about, how do I turn this into a business? Now, this, this woman did not have the, the right level of education, but she had a great idea. She got a lot of mentoring, she got a lot of assistance, she got interest by people with money, and she's now running a, a, a chain of salons. You know, and she, and she brought with her employment out of the favelas into uh, you know, a, a much more um, economically healthy environment. Um, we also see women that start up businesses and fail, and they don't have a network that can help them out of that. 
Uh, we had another story where a woman came to the conference and said, I, I'm going to have to shut down my, my business. It's not working. And then a, a network of friends came in, helped her, and, and she ended up retaining the business. So, you know, what we find is critical here is establishing this network, getting help. We now have thousands of women in the Dell Women's Entrepreneurial Network that are uh, talking to each other every day through LinkedIn. We're going to be in Turkey this year, uh, and we'll have several hundred women attend that are now successful entrepreneurs. So I think this is something that has to, it takes a little time, but as women begin to help each other and mentor each other uh, and get to that point where they can ask, they can ask for things and not be, uh, not be afraid to put themselves forward, then we can see this get much, much better. I, thank you. Um, I want to ask a question to all the panelists. Um, I think many of you in the audience today aren't just digital natives, you're mobile natives. Um, I remember um, Jack Dorsey spoke last night about when he got his first Macintosh computer in 1984. I remember um, when, and I can't, in a true confession, remember whether it was Santa Claus or my parents gave me a, a Commodore computer for Christmas in 1987. And just how magical that moment was when I got a computer and that I could look for Carmen Sandiego on the computer and, you know, and do, and do math homework. Um, and that that really, at the time, felt like something profound, even if I didn't quite understand at you know, the age of seven what was about to unfold. Um, and you know, there's 7.1 billion people in the world, and there are even more mobile subscribers. And I think that there is another profound moment happening with the explosion of mobile technology. And so I'd like to ask just each of you how you think the explosion of mobile technology, of mobile phones, and then of the kind of you know, quickly building tsunami of smartphones as they become cheaper and more pervasive around the world, will enable women and young girls to have more power over their own future, to really be empowered even when you know, maybe the societies or the history, to your point, Dr. Yunus, yeah. don't want them to, to move forward. Will they be able to just supersede all of those historical, normative, social barriers because like, the future can be in their pocket? Do you want to, yeah, can, can please? Can I just, uh, good, uh, one thing that we, we have gone through at, uh, in 1996, Bangladesh had about half a million telephones, landline telephones, no other telephone at all. And most of them didn't work because it's a government-run telephone agency. Uh, it's the usual story of those. Uh, the government was uh, uh, issuing new license for uh, mobile phone license. So one thought came to our mind that why don't we take a license and bring mobile phone in the country and give mobile phone in the hands of the poor women in the villages. Because this is a daring thing to think, to have bring mobile phone in the village, not for the women, just in the village, because all the phones are concentrated in the city. So people laughed at us, what kind of telephone company will that be? Nobody will buy that telephone. Yeah. We said, no, we'll make it sure, we'll give it to the phone in the hands of the poor woman. We'll give loans from Grameen Bank so that she can buy a telephone. And then they ask, what is she going, who is she going to call? I said, well, don't worry about who she's going to call. She'll sell the service of the phone. Anybody who wants to make a phone call has to come to her and pay her. This will be her income generating activity. They laughed. We launched it in 1997. And quickly, women mastered the technology of mobile phone. These are illiterate women. And we started calling them telephone ladies in the village. And they became the center of attraction for the whole village. Because the, so they, they, they were the like they, the old-fashioned red telephone booths in yes, London. Indeed, indeed. You had yeah, and to, and then very quickly we came to nearly half a million telephone ladies in the whole country, <laughs> making money. Today, in 2013, the total telephone in the country is about 90 million subscribers. Starting in 1996, half a million. Today nearly 90 million telephone subscribers all over the country. And how did that change how women were perceived in these villages? Everything. Everything. Because 
This gives the vo people who are voiceless a voice. You don't have to go through the bureaucracy of your family or hierarchy of your family to tell something to somebody. You just dial the phone, you get anywhere. One of the first thing we did when we gave the telephone in the villages to poor women, we gave her a, a small card with important telephone numbers. First telephone number is the telephone number of the prime minister. Her office number, her home number, said, what am I going to do? They said, you just call the number, somebody has to respond there. Because they don't know who is calling. They think it's a very important person. After all, prime minister is being called. And you start talking to her. And that definitely deserves a round of applause. <laughs> and, and then the minister of, minister of Women Affairs, you tell whenever you're angry, you tell her what's going wrong with you, what's going wrong with her. And then member of the parliament from your area, this, he or she is your representative. So you tell her. You don't have to go to his house. You don't have to battle with his guards. You just dial the number, it'll be there. And the, num the number of the police chief in the village or in the county, so that you can co talk to the police chief. So the uses they made of that, threat they have made, the women making threat that I have the number of the prime minister. Am I supposed to talk to the prime minister to solve this? And people say, ah, ah, this is a crazy woman. She might call the prime minister. <laughs> So that gives tremendous power, even if you, without calling her, you are actually, the position of the telephone number and the position of the phone transforms everything. And then the girls, there's a mother talking, and the young girls growing up in the family, they're not limited by the family and the village anymore. They're talking to people everywhere. So the power of technology can go far beyond what it was intended for. Like the Facebook. Today, you, you, they build their own community right here. It's a, and it's not, extend, it's not limited to the city folks, even the village people, because the, today telephone is internet-enabled telephone. It's no longer the old-fashioned hello, hello telephones. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very powerful thing. And we are talking about the education for girls, which is very important for them to support, but technology can transform everything. You can, today, millions, even billion people are illiterate on this planet. All we have to design is software where it will be like uh, playing uh, uh, games on the, tele uh, on the screen. And even the six-year-old, seven-year-old kids get so excited about playing games. Nobody teaches him or her. Speak figures out. So that learning languages, learning alphabets, learning how to read and how to write should be like games. People will be so excited to learn that and communicate with each other just the designing of a software. And anybody here can do that. It doesn't need a big, fantastic mind to do that. Anybody who has a creative idea can do that, and everybody will be literate, sending emails to everybody else. You know, I think we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hire Dr. Yunus to be our chief marketing officer for uh, right now. for Dell because I couldn't agree I couldn't agree more. And and you know I think great companies usually surround themselves around a purpose, uh, and and for Dell it's always been enabling human potential. And I think this past few years, uh, with the explosion of, of this technology, has really demonstrated uh, what Jack Dorsey said yesterday, which was that it, it used to be that small, large bodies controlled all the information uh, and even all the markets. And now it is truly leveled the playing field so f women can access anyone, any market, any supply chain, any customer, anywhere around the world because of this technology, whereas before you were limited to your local, your local community. But I think for women in particular, there is another great benefit about social media, and that is about enabling self-expression. Because again, in the U.S., we take this for granted, that anyone can say anything they want at any, any time. But in many, many parts of the world, you can't do that. Uh, my, my daughter's actually part of the Clinton Global Initiative, and, and her, she and her roommate, uh, they started a, a uh, website called Story Society, and it's aimed at women in developing countries to learn how to read and write, but more importantly, to learn how to express themselves, uh, because many of them have not had an opportunity to say what they really think. And uh, it's been amazing to watch 
in these countries, and I'm sure I'm sure you see it more more than anyone. Where lots of stories to share. Right, that's right. So I, I think the the smart that the technology gets to the point where no one can track it all. It's too it's too big. No one can. There is no Big Brother watching every little thing because it's just too much now. Uh, and so the the smartphones, the PCs, the internet, they're just enabling a true expression of freedom. So maybe the absence of a big brother enables all the little sisters to flourish. Um, well, uh, I think part of the uh, reason why SOLA is, uh, our school is so unique is that uh, our system in the public uh, education system is so uh, focused on rote memorization. There is no room for uh, critical thinking, innovative thinking, creativity. Um, and we supplement that kind of education uh, for our students at SOLA. Um, and so when, when I, when I uh, decided to uh, start this boarding school, um, you know, I was fresh out of uh, Middlebury College. I was not an educator by profession. I, didn't, I unfortunately didn't even take a class in education. Um, but you know, I had this determination to run this school. And one of the first things that I um, turned to um, when I decided that I, I wanted my students to be challenged to think critically, to uh, think crit creatively, because we do look at them as the future leaders of Afghanistan. And for that, they do need to have that kind of exposure, that kind of education to be able to compete with the rest of the world. And the first things I did was to uh, turn to my friends and colleagues in Middlebury Town to uh, uh, mentor them through Skype. So every single student at SOLA has a Skype mentor, and we still get lots and lots of requests from people. Very recently, our mentors have outnumbered the number of students we have, which is great news. Um, and we have visiting volunteer teachers who are in colleges or just out of uh, college uh, who teach our students. But um, when it comes to you know, the power of technology, we have these girls um, who come from different parts of the country. Uh, for some of them, it's the first time they own a computer. You know, we get lots of universities, uh, different companies who donate uh, computers to us. And when they own their computer, we you know, help them open a Gmail account or an email so that we can communicate with them. The next thing I know is I get a friend request from them on Facebook. <laughs> All already connected, they have figured out their way through uh, navigating you know, social media and all of, uh, all of the things that is out there. And, and then you see them uh, already writing blogs, uh, expressing their opinions about problems, concerns they have both uh, in Afghanistan as general or women's rights issues. Um, they follow news uh, and things that really upset them. They then write uh, opinion pieces and that get, get them published in, in different uh, blogs. And, 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 and just simply to be able to be in charge of the information you receive is empowering in and of itself. Um, for them to know that um, you know they can read whatever they choose to, they can talk about things, and and all of a sudden Facebook becomes a platform where they um, get in discussions about uh, with with strangers about uh, different topics and issues uh, surrounding women's rights, education, and so on. So um, I think there. Uh, if, if there is one good news for Afghanistan um, to change on such a f fast track is that it's the power of technology and social media that helps a lot of uh, people, particularly women, um, reach uh, information, be able to share problems and concerns with the rest of the world um, even so much more than ever before. Dr. Abdi, you go. I will, I will explain a little bit. Uh, technology helped in Somalia what people think Somalia, it's the war and piracy, but it helped in the most important point, it's the financial. The, the largest carrier Somali phone company created this app system, you can put the money in your phone, and you can use using shopping, buying, sending money to different people, so Somali women have a power to control their money. So it's a most important way the technology is supported in Somalia because you are in the midst of the war, you cannot carry money. You might get looted in the road, but you have everything in your phone. You just put your own pin code, nobody can get it through. You can have it, send your family, send to school if you want to pay school fees. It's, and it didn't, I, I wish we could have that in here in the US. <laughs> you, you can use a phone just to, buy everything you want. So it's, it's very important technology. In Somalia, we still have very low literacy, so women still cannot read or blog or web. 
do serving in the web, but they at least can have a power of financial freedom using technology. And how do you think that's changing um, girls' understanding of their potential future? When they see their mothers empowered over kind of the family finances, how is that changing how girls then understand what's possible for their own futures? They're very excited. They're very excited, and I think they will be more powerful than their own mothers in, in the future. Because, uh, they see the mothers doing everything, as you said, buying and selling, and you don't have to share even your husband, as, as Dr. Mohammed Yun is saying, you know, I have to give my, my husband money. Now you have your phone, you have your own PIN code, your husband doesn't know you can keep whatever you want separately, which is beautiful. <laughs> well, thank you, Diego. So I think that's a, that's a good uh, entrance into our first question from Twitter from Ryan Olson. In what ways do assumptions and stereotypes about manhood hinder men's engagement in supporting the rights of women? Who wants to go first, well, Dr. Yunus? Just let me give an example from my own experience. When we begin the lending money to women, the opposition that we faced was from the men in the same family. It's not the men from other families, the husband became the opponent of our giving loan to his wife. And we wonder, why is he opposing? It's, then we started realizing that he feels threatened, that for the first time, his wife is given the power of handling money. That threatened him, his authority over the family. Then they con kept on cons insisting on that, that we should not lend money to the wife, it should, we should give it to him. Then another idea, another thing that came out very clearly, he has no confidence in his wife's ability to pay it back. He feels that she will be make a mess out of this money we are giving her, and ultimately he has to pay back the loan. So we started explaining to them, look, if she fails, you will not be responsible. Don't worry about that. It's not easily to be convinced. He said, she doesn't know anything. How dare you give her money? She doesn't understand how to handle money. He fears that this docile woman in the family would make, will not make any good judgment with handling this money, and it will be a sure disaster. So we said, have a little bit of patience and see. If she is making wrong things, you let us know. We'll start talking to her. So we at least persuaded him to have some patience. He feels that he would, she will be failing her first installment. There, all our loans are paid back in installments. She was not. She did the first installment. So she said, maybe second installment. She or she will do that. And second, she did all All the way through, she paid the whole loan. That transformed the husband. For the first time, husband started thinking, maybe she's not as stupid as, she, as he thought. So these are the kind of things. And is that changing then how... The children are treated, both the boys and the girls in families? Yes, it's changed everything. Because suddenly you see that the women is not the same. And today, after 37 years of our work, many families of Grameen families, women is the major income earner in the family than the men. So it transformed the whole family completely. The children are going to school. And this is one of the part of things that we encourage, that every child go, should go to school. Because the mother herself, the borrower herself, is totally literate. Nobody gave her a chance to go to school. We said, not for your children. And mother understood it very clearly. So she sent every single child to school, and they started coming to the college level. So we gave them education loan. So we have hundreds of thousands of young people from Grameen families with education loan from Grameen Bank are going to the professional school become engineers, doctors, and professional people. So the whole scenario of the family has changed. And girls are not distinguished between the boys and the girls because mother is the one behind the daughter. She, she, wants she has the purse strings. She has the purse strings. I guess um, one of the things that could uh, potentially discourage men's engagement in, in supporting women's rights is when when a uh, woman's education or woman's rights is talked about as if it's just an issue affecting women. I guess uh, one of the great things that happening in, in, in today is age is that we talk about the value of um, educated women and women's rights being a, a, an important issue for all. 
I, we talk about the social benefits, the economic benefits, and, and, and for the rest of the world. And I guess that's when you can begin to bring men into the conversation. When you talk about, look, you know, if India sends one more percent of its girls to school today, their GDP will rise by $5.5 billion. And, you know, if you talk about, look, if your daughter is educated, she will raise educated children. Um, her income, 90% uh, of her, uh, she is more likely to spend more than 90% of her income back into the family raise educated children. And so when you talk about all these benefits, then it becomes an issue not just uh, pertaining to women, but it's an issue of uh, you know, family, men and women, and that's when you can uh, engage men uh, to get them from feeling threatened by a woman's empowerment and education to becoming part of the solution, thinking about solutions to uh, educate women. So I guess that's, that's really important for people who are involved. You know, look, I believe in education for all, men and women, but the reason I'm focused on girls' education in Afghanistan today is because I know how many more women, and particularly young girls, uh, lack uh, access to education for various reasons that I also talked about before. And then it does not just become issue of women. I talk about uh, working with fathers who who send their daughters, and, and that is really important to, to, to potentially stop the threats you know, that men put, could feel is to get them engaged in, into that conversation. And, I mean, this is also uh, something that has, has been uh, proven true for the United States. From, in 1970, um, women comprised about 37% of the labor force, and in 2009, it was 48%. It's actually now above 50%. Um, but from 1970 uh, to 2009, just the entrance of that additional percentage of women into the labor force added $3.5 trillion to the American GDP. I mean, that's a lot of money. Um, so it's clearly not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. Now, I want to take another uh, question from Twitter, and this is from Ashley Teo. There's a lot of emphasis on entrepreneurship, but what are the other ways we can financially empower women since it's not a path for everyone? Stephen, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because you clearly are focused on building kind of mentorship support for a variety of women who are choosing very different paths for themselves at Dell. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the f we do a lot of mentoring all around the world, and uh, I get to meet with lots of groups of, of um, women, and one of the things that strikes me is how frequent I get the question, basically, that says, how can I be more like a man? And, oh, you God, know, my, that's depressing. Isn't it? Isn't it? And that my... My first, you know, my quick answer is well, you're thinking about this all wrong. You know, that is, not, that is not the way to get ahead, that you've got to be yourself. And, um, you know, this is much more than entrepreneurship. It's clearly much more about, about women um, getting educated on all the aspects of leading their life in a way that demonstrates the power, the power that, they, that they have. I mean, when you think about it, I think it's been said, but two-thirds of the purchasing that's done in the world, you know, 12 trillion out of 18 trillion dollars is influenced or controlled by a woman. All right, so there is, there's a lot of power out there already, and it's really harnessing, it's really harnessing that power, uh, and, and I I, we just have to come back to the education and the mentoring to take charge. You don't have to take charge in an aggressive way, you know, back to this question of how do I act more like a man. You have to do it in a way that demonstrates adding value. And, and I think what the mentoring has to be really about is how do you take your great ideas and create value? Because as you just said a minute ago, it's just good sense. It's good sense economically. It's good sense socially. And I think most logical people will come to that conclusion when they see the value that's added. But if you're silent and you're quiet about it, no one's going to see that, that power. Sure. Just uh, two quick points. Uh, I will take that question and uh, put it in separate ways. This is not a gender issue, whether uh, you should be an entrepreneur or you should be working for somebody else. Uh, these are choice issues for anybody, for men, women, everybody. Uh, this is uh, something we try to encourage uh, among our young people in Bangladesh, particularly among the Grameen's young people. 
that uh, they say that there's no, not many jobs in the country, so where do we go after we do our graduation and so on? I said, forget about that old-fashioned idea of getting a job. You make a pledge to yourself, and always repeat this pledge to you, yourself every, every day, and the pledge is, I'm not a job seeker, I'm a job giver. Getting a job is my mission. So it's a, it's a mental thing. It's not something that uh, you, uh, like, I have to have a job. Why do you have to have a job? Why can't you create a job? So it's, and I always insist all human beings are entrepreneurs, no exception. So it's a choice whether I want to be an entrepreneur or I want to take a job under an entrepreneur. This is your choice. It's not a question of a girl or a question of a boy. It's a question of what you want to do with your life. So you prepare yourself as you grow up in your education, education life, in your preparation life, what path you would like to take, a job seeker or a job giver? Now, we're out of time, but I do want to ask one um, last question uh, from each of the panelists, and I'll start with you know, Dr. Abdi and Diko. Um, to each of you, though, are you optimistic about the future of women and girls in Somalia, in the United States, in Bangladesh, in Afghanistan? Are you optimistic? And if you're not optimistic, what can we in this room here this morning do to help make you more optimistic? Yes, I am optimist. And I hope in the future that the world will be one. Because human being is one, the world is one. The, the needs of human being is one. So they have to collectively work and defend their world to make better place. I think so. Stephen? Oh, I'm incredibly optimistic. Just, just from this room, this has to make you feel good. Just seeing the, uh, the impressive array of, of talented women. Uh, this, is, this is something that just takes a little bit of time, but I think it's sort of exploding. And this whole pay it forward concept is, is really the most critical way of each of you can reach out to several more, you know, it doesn't take very long to have millions of women feeling empowered around the world. So it, there's no doubt this is going to continue in a very positive way. Dr. Yudin? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm very positive, very enthusiastic about future, uh, uh, particularly looking at the young people. Uh, I kept repeating, uh, this is my favorite way of expressing myself, that the, today's young, young generation is the most powerful young generation in human history. Not because they are any different than other, human, other young generation, just because they're endowed with enormous technology in their hand, which no other generation ever in history had that technology. And the question is, what are you going to do with this power of technology? What are you going to do with your creative power that gives you the express yourself in this technological world? And that is something they should ask themselves. And I keep repeating that every one of this young generation has the power to change the whole world. Each one, not collectively, each one of this young generation has the power to change the whole world and create a world where there'll be nobody who will be a poor person. Create a world where nobody will be a sick person or a, uh, deprived of health care or unemployed person. Why should anybody be unemployed? These are the challenges they have to work on. And if they imagine that world, that world will take place. If they don't imagine, it will not take place. Shabana? Oh. Uh. Um, I'm op optimistic about uh, the future of uh, girls and women and the people of Afghanistan for so many reasons. One, Afghanistan is a very young country. Uh, more than 70% of uh, the population in Afghanistan is 25 or under. And so that, there you see a lot of uh, incredible opportunity for uh, growth and for, uh, for positive and forward thinking. The other is, I think, uh, because um, our world is increasingly becoming such a small global village that um, people are realizing, and unfortunately from some of the harsh uh, history in Afghanistan, like nine, uh, like in the world, like 9-11, that has taught us that an issue affecting a particular country is not just of that country's business or problem. It, it could potentially affect the rest of the world. And for that, I think uh, I, I do see a future in Afghanistan. Um, you know, look, I'm, I'm 
I have this five-year or 10-year plan to turn our very small school of 25 students now into an internationally accredited boarding school in Afghanistan where I hope to see people from the US, Canada, neighboring countries and elsewhere attend school. Can you imagine someone saying, my daughter is going to a boarding school in Afghanistan? What? <laughs> you know, that's, that's the uh, goal I'm working towards. And for that, 2014 is not going to stop me or m the students we have in our school and their families. Um, there will be 2015 in Afghanistan, there will be life and there will be future. And, and if I weren't an optimist and uh, in, a, in a more, in a very real way um, or realistic way, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. Well. I am, I mean, I'm a self-avowed optimist too, uh, and partly because of all the work that you are all doing and the work that you will do, and the work that all of you will do. I think that each of these stories in many ways are um, further challenges and I hope inspirations to each one of you. And I hope that if you want to learn how to start your own internationally accredited boarding school, or how to start a mentoring program, or how to start a bank, or how to build a clinic and a school and house 90,000 people, you'll find all of the panelists after the program concludes this morning. Thank you all for being here, and thank all of you for being with us.